Okay, so I'd like to um, go back to presentation mode here and, and talk a bit about um, the geodatabase um, and this concept of data models or templates that we're going to be using to kind of start off uh, GIS projects. So first I'd like to talk about this concept of enterprise GIS. Um, a lot of times people think about using GIS for uh, one particular purpose when really it's a system that's, uh, that's capable of doing all sorts of different types of information management and can be really uh, powerfully in implemented in uh, different parts of the uh, uh, different parts of your institution. So um, the most common use of GIS is to use it for, uh, excuse me while I fix my microphone here. Can you guys hear me in the back? Is that better? Um, so one of the, the most common uses of GIS uh, at the garden is to use it for asset management. So um, many of us will think of our plants as being one of our um, most valuable assets. Uh, so it's obviously used for that, but it can also be used for you know, managing uh, things like our benches that are out there, uh, even our buildings, our, uh, you know, our pavement, paved surfaces, all sorts of stuff, and to be able to track information about their uh, condition and maintenance and inspection and all sorts of things like that. So it's really powerful for that. Once you've got all that kind of information into your GIS and you know where everything is, you can really use GIS for emergency response. So if you're at a public landscape and you have visitors coming, you can use it to be able to create um, you know, evacuation plans and provide information to uh, emergency responders. You can use it for project management if you are um, working on complicated projects, development projects, redevelopment projects on your property. You can manage all that information in the GIS, keep your as-built drawings, things like that. Um, in this diagram we have customer service written down, but uh, really our customers are generally our visitors and being able to produce visitor maps and uh, tour maps and things like that for them uh, can be done really easily with the GIS. Um, engineering uh, for any kind of construction projects that you have going on, once you have all this information in the GIS, and a new project is being done, you can provide uh, you know, contractors with the, uh, you know, the layout of, or the layout of the site and where plants are that are sensitive um, and measurements on, on heights and other things that you may have in your database. Um, it's, GIS can be really easily adapted to mobile devices so we can take it outside with us in any number of formats and uh, view and edit the information that we have. Um, work order management is a really good one. Uh, you can uh, link it up with work order management systems. So if you're out on your property and you find that there's a tree down, uh, you can put in a work order for that and it goes back into the office and people will uh, in the office who are going to respond to that will know uh, where that tree is because you've collected it with your GIS and or GPS unit so you, you have a location tied to that and they know exactly what needs to be done. Uh, site selection is really, say you have a new plant that, uh, that's come in that requires certain uh, conditions, requires maybe wet soil, um, it can't take afternoon sun, um, and it needs to be uh, you know, close enough to a uh, water source so that it's wet. Uh, you can use the GIS to be able to help you find the best location uh, to put that plant. Uh, so lots and lots of different things that you can do with the GIS uh, once you've get, got all that information in there. So I want to talk a little bit about data models. Um, the official definition of a data model is uh, in that quote there at the, the top of the slide, but really a data model is just a database schema or a template for getting started with a GIS project. And there's currently over 30 different uh, data models out there for the ArcGIS software that we're working today for all different sorts of industries. There's one for uh, you know, the petroleum industry, there's one for foresters, there's one for doing biodiversity conservation. So all these different templates for using GIS for different uses, uh, uses. and uh, the uh, one we're going to be working with today is one that we've been working on that's specifically designed uh, for public gardens and uh, other similar landscapes. 
So um, a few years ago, we got a grant from Institute of Museum and Library Services to, uh, to create this model um, that we're all going to be working with today. And uh, the goal of the project was to really create a free and open source template um, with documentation for starting up a GIS project. Um, free, obviously, you don't have to pay anything for it. You can download it. Just provide us with your contact information. You're, wel you're welcome to download it. And open source, meaning that it's uh, totally changeable. You can uh, customize it to your heart's content. So we look at it as a template that you can um, add things to, delete things from, um, and customize really as much as you need to to serve your garden's needs. And we wanted to make it, we knew that uh, we knew that gardens you know, came in all different sizes and operating budgets, um, so we wanted to make it uh, so that it was adjustable to all those different uh, kind of uses and come, uh, so tried to make it in light, medium, and extra strength uh, version. So it's complex enough to be used by the largest um, uh, garden that may have uh, all sorts of complex needs, but it's also able to be used by uh, someone who just wants to uh, map their pro personal property. So. And because gardens are so complex, sometimes uh, we wanted to, we knew that we weren't going to be able to design this thing that accommodates everybody's needs. So we tried to focus on the features that provide the greatest benefit uh, to the majority of gardens. And um, because a lot of gardens already have dedicated database systems that they use to manage their plant records, we uh, opted not to uh, make something that replaced those, but it worked in conjunction with them. So you can link those two systems together um, so that you can uh, click on plants on your map and pull up information that may come from another database. So um, as I mentioned, the complexity of modeling a garden um, is, was uh, quite high. And we like to think of gardens as kind of like small cities, is that we have a lot of the same things. We have transportation. We have utility networks. We have buildings um, and all sorts of things that we needed to consider um, and try to include in this, in this model. So we did a survey um, of the public garden community and uh, found out that obviously plants uh, were one of the most important things that they wanted to have in there. Uh, and then what we call base map data or um, kind of the, the underlying information that's on your map. So maybe the locations of uh, boundaries and the locations of maybe soil types and uh, buildings. And then facilities and infrastructure, uh, things like built utility networks and roads and things like that also came out as being really important. So we created a model with all of those things in it and there's currently capacity to map over 150 different types of things uh, with this uh, model and the diagram in the lower right shows you kind of uh, in color the things that we the pieces of the model that we have built and in gray um, kind of some of the things that we're um, looking towards building in the future so we hope to continue to expand uh, the model to allow for it to, to incorporate lots of different things. Um, I think that's a duplicate. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some terminology that's going to be kind of important for you guys to get a bit of a handle on because we're going to interact with uh, these kind of things uh, on and off throughout the day. So I'm going to talk about these things briefly and it's, uh, you'll probably have some questions uh, about these, but as we start to work with them more and more throughout the day, hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. So uh, one of the most important pieces of terminology we're going to be using today is uh, talking about something called a feature class. Um, and these are really different types of things or objects inside of our model. Um, and a feature class can come in a few different flavors. Uh, one is a feature class that maps the, uh, a point feature, so something like a plant. One that maps a line feature, something like a fence. Um, and another that maps a polygon feature, uh, something like a building. And then there's a fourth one called annotation, which are basically text or labels that you have on your map. So maybe you'd have annotation for, um, for each of your plants that has the scientific name and accession number um, that we'll be working with today. So there's the different types of feature classes. Just think of them as uh, kind of containers for holding different types of uh, geographic information. Uh, and then, just like any other database, we can also have tables inside of our uh, geo database. And tables, just as they sound, are rows and columns of information like you would see in an Excel spreadsheet or an access database. 
<laughs> and each one of these, uh, each one of each feature inside of a feature class or a table um, can have a subtype. So um, in the case of say fences, or a, we have a feature class that's called barriers, right? And inside this feature class, we can have uh, a chain link fence, we can have a retaining wall, and we could have a seat wall, and all these are different subtypes of that particular type of fence. So we'll interact with those uh, a lot more as we go along today. Um, and then uh, there's a thing called a relationship that basically connects different things together. So um, in the case of a particular section of our garden, we may have a boundary drawn around this section of our garden. And inside that section, we may have different uh, planting areas or different spots that we, uh, that we name and pl we put plant our plants. And when you click on that section of the garden, we may have that related to these planting areas so that you can click on the section and you see all the different planting areas that are inside of it. And then all the different plants that are inside of those planting areas. So all those things are kind of connected together so that uh, it's really easy to organize and manage our information. Uh, we have another thing called a topology, uh, which is a group of rules, really, um, that kind of control the quality of our data. So we've created rules uh, such as that your um, a building, a polygon for a building, should not overlap a polygon for water. Um, so if you've done a sloppy job drawing in your your data on your map and you've kind of overlapped these two things, um, it may throw up an error for you and tell you that, hey, you've you've kind of done a done some crap work here and you need to go back in and fix it. So we've created a lot of those rules to uh, help control the quality of your data and we'll have a, a couple brief uh, interactions with those today. And then uh, probably the most, uh, another important one to know about is what's called a domain. Um, and a domain is basically a list of valid values that we've set up for fields. So when you go and you're entering data about your plants, um, Maybe when you get to the plant condition field, we have a drop down list of possible values that you can pick. So instead of you typing in those values and maybe not being consistent and not spelling things right, we've created these drop down lists for different lists of values, um, and those are called domains. Um, so we'll interact with those uh, some today, too. Any questions about that? As I said, all these things will make a little bit more sense as we see them in action. So this crazy complicated thing is what a what the data model looks like when we try to draw it out on paper um, and all the different things that we were just talking about are uh, denoted here and I, I don't expect you to be able to read this and we don't really we won't have to get into this level of complexity of what the model is I just wanted to kind of let you know that all this complexity exists and we have these references if you really want to dig under the hood of it um, and a lot of these different things are all uh, those terminology pieces that we just talked about are diagrammed here but I would like to talk about a little bit more about how some of these things in the data model work and I want to show you uh, that uh, some of the relationships and things between a different objects. So in this particular diagram, we've got, um, let me turn this on, we've got uh, feature classes are in blue here. And then relationships between them are in green. And what we've got here is that this, uh, this polygon feature class here is called section. So this is used for, to, to kind of draw the boundaries around different parts of our garden. And this relationship here is that it says section has structures. So this means that each section can have one or many uh, structures or buildings inside of it. And if you remember, we talked uh, briefly about subtypes. And this particular structure can have many different kinds of, of subtypes. So it has, it could be an administration building, an education building, an exhibit, a facilities structure, a research building, a visitor amenity, uh, could be mixed use or uh, even other types. So those are different subtypes. And then to dig down further into these relationships, the, each structure can have a uh, enclosure. So this relationship of structure has enclosures. And sometimes we get this model being used by uh, zoos or other uh, places that have animals in captivity. And, uh, right, and they may have you know, many different animals in different enclosures inside of a particular building. So you may go to the reptile exhibit and they have you know, 15 different uh, enclosures that have different snakes inside of them um, or other reptiles. And so this is a relationship here that if we clicked on this building, we could find out what animal enclosures are contained inside of it. 
and these different the enclosures have different subtypes. It could be amphibian, could be bird, could be an insect, fish, uh, plant, reptile, or other. And then another relationship here is that um, our structure may have entrances and exits, um, and we've mapped those out on the map. So you can map all the entrances and exits and be able to use that for doing emergency response and evacuation plans and things like that. So when we click on this structure, we can find out what entrances and exits are associated with it, and we can find out uh, maybe information about who to contact in the case of emergency, who has the keys to that entrance and exit, how wide is it, um, all that kind of information. So that's basically how the data model is set up to be able to provide us with uh, information uh, really easily. Any questions about that? So if we actually, if we drill down a little bit further and zoom in to uh, this structure feature class here, we can see that in more detail we have, this is a list of all the fields that we have associated with this feature class. So we can see that each structure has a type, it has a name, has an address, date it was construction, constructed, life expectancy, a, even a, a link to the construction document associated with that, so the blueprint maybe for the building. Um, number of levels that it has, um, does it have water utilities, gas utilities, telephone, sewer, heating, cooling, etc. So all kinds of information about it, even if it's ADA accessible um, and things of that nature. And then you can see here under this domain column, it says that we have this yes, no domain associated with this field. If we look over here in red, we see that this domain, the only possible values are yes and no. So that means that this field for whether this building has water utilities, the only value we can put in that is for yes or no. So those are those, those, are those domains and how we kind of control um, what kind of data you can put into different fields. And you have the ability to customize those uh, to your heart's content.